Thank you very much, Tom. That was wonderful to hear. It's an honor to be here. Uh, great honor. And thank you all for coming on this rainy day. I'm, uh, I'm going to read poems that, that are coming out in a book in about two years. Uh, I don't have a name for the book, really, yet. Sometimes a poem begins with just a sound. I'll have a sound in my ear that comes together in a couple of words, and then I follow those words, and uh, really have no idea where the poem is going. And it, uh, one just doesn't turn away from it. The words that began this were an orangutan with an orange tam o' shanter. I kept going around that sound, orangutan with an orange tam o' shanter. And it created a tone in the language that led to the uh, rest of the poem. So it's not my fault. Uh, this is called The Exigencies of Art. When a tenor in a too tight tux begins to sing Schubert Lieder on the stage of a famous hall, an orangutan in an orange tam o' shanter struts up to the mic, squats at the tenor's feet, takes a dump, then lopes across the stage and disappears. In response, the tenor hits half a dozen mistaken sharps and flats, while the audience of 2,000 feels their attention sidetracked, roller coastered, in fact, in 2,000 different ways. Bravely, the tenor yanks his tune back on track and wonders if he should quickly kick the awful ape offal off stage. <laughs> With his shiny black wingtip, the pianist considers halting for a jiffy and hiding the reeking atrocity under a page of Schubert already successfully sung. The more serious music lovers see this as a test of art that it makes them lift their minds above the humdrum, in this case five pounds of orangutan splop, and focus <laughs> on Schubert's liquid interpolations of tragic themes. But the 50 kids scattered through the hall all perk up. A second earlier, they were squirming, complaining, twiddling their thumbs, tugging their mother's sleeves, when something wonderful happened. A champion marched across the stage and shat. And the music, which till then had been no more than a jittery tinkling, a random screech, now takes on heroic proportions, like Achilles disemboweling Hector, or Pegasus bounding through the air, entranced, sitting like statues, the children wait for the orangutan to reappear and treat them to another trick, perhaps throw up. What, <laughs> what an awful evening, say the parents later. How fantastic, say the kids. When can we go back again? It's hard work to be an artistic entrepreneur, a lover of beauty who must not only regale the present crowd, but seduce a troop of future fans. Like when you pop the clutch to get an old car moving, or a mother puts a pair of falsies on her skinny daughter. So at times, art requires a kick to get the soul dancing. Late that night, at the stage door, the orangutan drops by for his 50 bucks, and the boss slips him an extra 10 for a job well done. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> True story. <laughs> this is called Field Notes on Divine Evolution. The first gods said, er, and I beg your pardon. They tapped people on the shoulder, people who wore the skins of saber-toothed tigers, if they wore anything at all. The first gods were bigger than people, but not big enough to be frightening. They would say, hey, look at that tree. I just made it. What do you think? The people wearing the skins would criticize the tree or yawn and walk away. It was like that all the time. What do you think of these rocks? What about this river? People put up with it. They didn't want to be impolite, but they felt more worldly, even superior. 
the next gods, decided right off the bat not to be pushovers. They invented cyclones, thunder, and lightning. They made floods and enjoyed seeing people run. They sat on the mountaintops and watched people run to the north, then run even faster to the south. People grew weak with fatigue. They slept more and never out in the open. They spent a lot of time saying they were sorry and blaming one another. My, my, my neighbor did it. I saw him. You heard people say that sort of thing like the refrain to a song. The gods that came next were very different. Whatever you have done or will do, they said, you're already forgiven. People came to a stop. They wanted it repeated, forgiven said the gods. We've made up our minds, good or bad, beautiful or ugly, it doesn't matter. You're off the hook. They put a, a few mortals in charge to make sure it was done right, but it's hard to be in charge when everybody has already been forgiven. It seems reckless, it seemed reckless to forgive even the bad people or the people who look like they'd be bad soon. Shortly, it was necessary to change the conditions. You were forgiven if you do this. You are forgiven if you do that. As for forgiveness, pure and simple, it was like a lion among school children, too risky to be let loose. When the last group of gods arrived, they were skeptical. They walked around the people and looked them up and down. They shrugged a lot and rolled their eyes. Not all were critical, but none were enthusiastic. They scowled and dragged their feet. Soon they wandered off to pursue their discussions, whether we have value, our mix of virtues and faults, whether there was reason to keep up the relationship. You ask about their language, they speak in colors. At times, the scrap of a single word, perhaps no more than the equivalent of a letter, may be briefly visible, but paler, a truncated shadow after traveling so far. We see it arcing through the sky after a summer rain, encouraging evidence that their debate still continues. This is a short poem. I was thinking of uh, childhood experiences that were not usually written about. And uh, this came to mind. Again, there were sounds that were banging together. The, 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 it's, a young, it's about a young boy. Uh, it's called Alligator Dark. You'll remember that under the, in the sewers of New York and Boston, and probably here in Atlanta too, if you've checked it out, are alligators. People get baby alligators, they start growing, and they don't, you know, so you put them down the toilet. And then they're still there. It's a, it's, a, it's a very dangerous place to be. In New York, they've had subway operators eaten. <laughs> Alligator Dark. Stiff as a fireman's spray, his urine smacks into the toilet bowl to spatter against the two-inch remnant of a cigarette, either a camel or lucky strike, both of which his parents smoke. Perhaps he is eight, a chaste delight in this pre-filter era before Freudian notions could for him ruin the simplest of pleasures. The butt's lipstick reddened tip bleeds into the murk. Take that, Mom. So the paper splits apart and tobacco bits skitter off like peewee lifeboats. The boy zips up as his mother shouts, What's taking you so long? Just washing my hands, he calls back before flushing the tiny survivors of the stricken liner down down to the alligator dark beneath the streets. <laughs> this is called Lessons from the Ancient World. Uh, it's about, uh, well, it's set in, it begins in Pisa, you know, the Leaning Tower. And it's about a, a group of elderly, elderly men. These men right now are on benches looking at the tower. With their liver-spotted hands gripping their crotches, these old men sitting on benches across the street from the leaning tower of Pisa know what it's like not to get it up. Despite its beauty of form, the intricate design of white stone, it leans and each year declines a little more. 
The old men sigh. The world bullies, bullies us with metaphor. Rome is packed with busted columns and oldsters creeping home. Each year, Venice sinks a little deeper into the muck, and them too. It's wrong to think that history's lessons are confined to books when every rusty car confirms a sorry story. Old men gather in the marketplace to pinch the fruit, but are themselves shortchanged. A few surround the statue of the goddess Venus, although busted up and missing limbs, her tits are as perky as ever. One old guy reaches out to touch her thigh, warmed by the afternoon sun, and in his brain, he hears a sudden humming as he recalls a girl's perfume, a summer night, all the never to be repeated cliches. Then it's gone. This is the way the road runs. And while the men may not complain, it came as a surprise. Does it dignify their plight to be mocked by art? Like butchered centaurs on a Grecian urn, perhaps they take comfort in the joint nature of their defeat, defining the defining male act at 90, the comic quipped, it's like shooting a pool with a rope. <laughs> That was George Burns who said that. It's like shooting pool with a rope. Uh, it's called hide and seek. At first, it's just a form of play. Your mother shuts her eyes or hides them with her hand. Briefly, she is gone. Are you afraid? Then, surprise, she's back again. A few years later, your favorite game is hide and seek. You wait behind a tree as your best friend counts to ten. Then. When it's your turn, you hunt for him. Doesn't this suggest the impossibility of getting lost? Your mother uncovers her eyes. Your friend uncovers your hiding place. The world's machinery won't let you disappear. As you grow older, you read of runaways returned, stolen children found again. We long to believe the world wants each of us in our own spot, safe and respected, even the unfortunate held dear. Yet increasingly on the street, you see the lost, men and women adrift between destinations. Do you see that man behind the tree? He waits for someone to finish counting. Then you see a man on a park bench, a woman idly smoking, don't they also seem to be waiting? If the first part of your life attempts to prove you can't be lost, then what belief directs the rest? Or are you lost from the start? That man watching from the bench, do you see how he listens? Does he, reg does he think someone seeks him even now? Does he regret that he hid himself so well? He stands up, takes a step, and as you pass on a bus, he catches your eye, glances back, as if at a scrap of paper that the wind flicks down the street. For a moment, you feel alarm. Lost, lost, you ask. When were we ever found? It begins to rain. The man slips from sight as the bus turns and stops, starts, and turns again. You forget, you forget. But don't quite forget, as you watch people with pursuits much like your own, hurry between two points, not quite lost, not yet found. Consider this, our first breath brought us here, and as sparks rise up from a fire, so we disappear. You may remember that in the Greek mythology, the first artist the first craftsman was also an engineer by the name of Daedalus. And he had lots of adventures. And there's a series of poems that, that talk about Daedalus. We think of him first, I suppose, for designing the uh, labyrinth for King Minos in Crete that was designed to contain the Minotaur, <coughs> King Minos's son steps on. And uh, once, he, once he had designed this labyrinth, the king couldn't let him go because he knew the secret of the labyrinth. So he was kept there in this kind of palace where all his needs were met. But it wasn't enough, and he and his son Icarus escaped. This is, so this is the first one, the cunning one. 
It happened like this. He lived in a palace, which was also a prison. You understand how nothing is ever simple. He had built a labyrinth for the king's monster's son, a great service, which came with a secret, one for the king, one on the builder's head. Be reasonable. Could the king ever permit him to return to the easy conversations of Athens? But because the king was grateful, no luxury was spared in the palace, which also was a prison. Wherever one looked, one found beauty and opulence, gorgeous wall hangings, thick rugs, soft cushions, all entertainments were prepared for him. From the scholarly, from the scholarly to the perverse, the moist flesh of children, stimulants to engender the sweetest dreams. Still, the door was locked, and after he walked to the rooms and saw what was to be seen, he ripped apart the feather cushions and made himself a pair of wings. By morning he was gone. How we love these stories. Think of Adam and Eve. Wasn't the garden for them a similar prison? And Satan, as he foresaw the eternity of heaven's coercive beauty, what could he do but rebel? One of the things that uh, took a certain amount of engineering skill on the part of Daedalus, that the queen of Minos had fallen in love with a uh, bull, and Daedalus was asked to make uh, a cow thing that the queen could get inside and seduce the bull. And that, that takes serious, top quality engineering. <laughs> It's called Artist, Artist. A knot of string, crossed sticks, a dab of ink. Can't any work begin as a passionate doodling? So here is another of his constructions, a wooden cow. But so skillful, even the bull was tricked. You see, one must reckon with the jaded boredom of queens. During the drawn out days, she lusted for this bull. What was he? Beef on the hoof. Nothing special. But she stood at the fence and watched his bull's prick, its muscularity, its obscene force, forcefulness, until she couldn't live without that dazzle within her. So she went to the artist, and he made a cow that the queen could hide herself within. The bull mounted the cow, but it was she, her aroused wetness. And the artist, can he be blamed for the ends for which he used his gift? He was the maker. It was his sickness. It masked what was made. Consider this. He never heard her root moaning. When uh, Daedalus first started making things, he lived in Athens, and, he, and then he worked with his nephew, and then he was banished from Athens. And this talks about that. It's called discord. Never discount what began his wanderings. In Athens, he was the greatest craftsman. So much work, he had to hire his nephew to help him. But his nephew had his gift, and soon people claimed the nephew's gift was greater than the uncle's. If the uncle built with bronze, the nephew built with gold. So his uncle worried and fussed, and at last he killed him, who also loved him. You see, he had no other choice. To be outdone meant to accept his obliteration for this murder he was banished from his homeland, but he had not reckoned with the arguments of the dead, how they hold the last word on all subjects. He would make the statue of a god or a bauble for a queen, then lift it up to the specter of his nephew. See this? He would say, could you ever make this? And of course the nephew was silent, itself an answer, the better answer. The uncle worked harder, statues and buildings became grander, and the uncle's traveling was ceaseless. He became known as the greatest of all craftsmen. You understand how fate can trick you. Without his nephew's murder, he would never have become famous. Yet what pleasure could he take in each new marvel, palace, or temple, when in its glossy surfaces he kept confronting the dead face he loved? You remember that uh, Daedalus had been with his son, and when they, and when they fled Minos' palace on these wings, which were held together with wax, Icarus flew too high, and the sun melted the wax. 
and he fell. And uh, this argues that he did this on purpose. Icarus's flight. Perhaps the boy could do nothing else. Wasn't flight both an escape and a great uplifting? And so he flew. But how could he appreciate his freedom without knowing the exact point where freedom stopped? So he flew upward, and the sun dissolved the wax, and he fell. But at least in his anticipated plummeting, he grasped the confines of what had been his liberty. You say he flew too far? He flew just far enough. He flew precisely to the point of wisdom. Would it have been better to flutter ignorantly from petal to petal within some garden forever? As a result, flight for him was not upward escape, but descent with his wings disintegrating around him. Should it matter that neither shepherd nor farmer with his plow watched him fall? He now had his answer, laws to uphold him in his downward plunge, cushion enough for what he wanted. When Daedalus uh, escaped from Minos, he had to hide because Minos was looking for him. And Minos went to all the surrounding kingdoms and asked the kings and little princes to, uh, he gave them a little task. He gave them a, a spiral shell and told them they had to run a, a, a thread through the spiral. And uh, obviously nobody could do it. This was something that only Daedalus could do. And this is how the king sought him. It's called blemished and unblemished. Say genius is one side of the mountain then is vanity the other? Remember Daedalus after, his, after he escaped from the king's prison. The king pursued him. He had many jewels, but Daedalus was brightest. Of course, Daedalus concealed himself. The king went to his lesser kings and set them a task. He gave each a spiral shell and told them to run a thread through the spiral, a tiny labyrinth, much like the one Daedalus had made for the king. And one after another, the lesser kings failed at this task. The great king came to Daedalus as his protector and set him the same task. Naturally, he couldn't untangle it, so he presented it to Daedalus, who guessed the reason for the puzzle, that he himself was the only person who could solve it. And this was how the king had meant to trap him. Still, Daedalus couldn't keep himself from the solution. He put a tiny hole in one end of the shell and covered it with a drop of honey. Then he tied a gossamer thread to the leg of an ant and the ant wound its way through the labyrinth to the sweetness. But it wasn't enough simply to work out the problem. It was also necessary that the solution be known. So he gave the shell to his protector who gave it to the king who charged that Daedalus be given back to him. The, pr the protector refused and a fight began in which many were killed, including the king himself, who had once been Daedalus' friend. Is this what makes art important to us? The paradox that the excellence of the work is fashioned from the mass of human failings. Here is vanity, here gluttony, here lust and murder, but polished with the blade of our imperfections blunted, the bloody stain washed out. Art bears witness to the possibility of perfection, not for us, but for what is made, white silks from muddy paws. And this is the last one, and the last one I'll read. It's called Last Wisdom. So often in this world, what is rejected creeps back to the heart. What is cast off again jams the brain. Consider Daedalus at the end of his life, gone to Sardinia as builder for the son of Heracles but faces fretted his memory, and he, began to, and he began to construct bronze dolls with movable limbs, forming their faces into the faces he once loved. Here was the son who tumbled into the sea. Here was his wife. 
Here was his sister who hanged herself, the nephew he murdered, the great king he had betrayed, and others. Their shapes filled his room. He clothed them and put hair on their heads. He placed small devices in their hearts so they could walk and lift their arms. They grouped in a circle around him, but they remained silent. He tried to make them talk. He cut out the tongues of birds and made boxes through which the air swirled to create a wailing. But still the creatures wouldn't speak. So Daedalus disguised his voice so it sounded like a woman's, then a boy's. You are forgiven, he said, and the bronze dolls jittered their arms. But when people passing on the street heard him call out, they jeered at him. You see, his gift stopped short of what he wanted most. You are forgiven, he shouted to the dumb things, but he spoke falsely. His trinkets gave no relief. Was this the wisdom to come to him last, that nothing could rid him of his isolation? His toys no longer hid what was there, himself and the night, and the only entry into night. Thank you.